Good afternoon, and welcome wherever, wherever you are joining us today. My name is Kevin Dumichel, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second session of our Claiming Space Symposium on Afrofuturism. This session, entitled Terrestrial Space, Reclaiming Landscapes, will give special attention to the utopian cities, mapped, reclaimed, and newly built monuments, and transformed landscapes that have long been cast as sites both real and imaginary of Afrofuturist potential. As our exciting and interdisciplinary panel of presenters will demonstrate, these spaces, present, potential, and even past, offer us new models, some speculative, some quite concrete, 
that together map new possibilities centered on African and African-American history, culture, and imagination. It has been an honor to work with my distinguished colleagues at the National Air and Space Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Ma National Museum of African Art to pull this program together. And I extend my sincerest thanks to them and to our incredibly hardworking symposium team who have faced every potential burden, including an ever evolving global pandemic with cheerful good humor and steadfast proficiency. This has been a beautiful example of the best of what the Smithsonian can be. I will give the briefest of introductions to our panelists before handing off to our discussant, Emmanuel Admasu, who will lead our discussion today. I hope by now you've had a chance to view all four of our panelists' 10-minute video submissions, but if not, fear not. They will remain available on this platform and on the symposium website, claimingspace.si.edu. I am a curator at the National Museum of African Art. While my practice there ranges from the arts of Africa's antiquity right up until the present day, I would like to add that I've done my own doctoral work in Ghana, looking at the architectural history of the city of Kumasi, capital of the Asante Empire. That project looked at the city as a site of an originary modernity from the 18th to the 20th century and as an incubator of architectural innovation. So I've been particularly energized to think through the spatial worlds that our panelists have opened up in their talks. Our discussant, Emmanuel Admasu, is an assistant professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and a founding partner with Jen Wood of ADWO, an art and architecture practice based in New York City, and by extension, between Melbourne and Addis Ababa. Our panelists, are Tawhida Shukriya Assad and Sinatra Smith, who ha together have presented a Philly John Curated Black Geographies. Tawhida Shukriya, Shukriya Assad is a doctoral candidate in media and communication at Temple University, while Dr. Smith, who was present for today's discussion, is the Clear DLF Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for African American Studies at the Philadelphia Museum of Art Library and Archives and Temple University's Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio. Julian Chambliss is Professor of English and the Val Berryman Curator of History at the MSU Museum at Michigan State University. Dr. Chambliss has presented on Recovering Black Speculative Space in Eatonville, Florida. Eto Atatidbe is a polymedia artist whose interdisciplinary practice includes sculpture, performance, installation, and public art, and serves as assistant, as assistant professor of sculpture in the art department at Brooklyn College. And among his many honors, I'm also pleased to note that Edo was the recipient of a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship at the National Museum of African Art, where he explored the intersection of Irhobo language and historical objects. He has presented on Unrecognizable Wreckage and Alien Shrapnel, Public Art as Cultural Transformer. Finally, Lisa Yazek is Regents Professor in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech where she explores science fiction as a global language crossing, crossing centuries, continents, and cultures. Dr. Yazek has shared with us a talk on a brief history of megacities and social justice in Black science fiction. With that, the panel and the floor is yours, Emmanuel. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, hello, everyone. I wanted to start off um, by discussing the reclamation of landscapes. Uh, all four of your projects are engaged in various forms of reclamation. Um, Julian, uh, your work reclaims the counter future narratives of Edenville, Florida. Uh, Sinatra, your project in collaboration with Tahida Assad, uh, reclaims the potency of Black public art uh, as sacred space for cultural preservation. Um, Lisa, your work reclaims the overlaps between uh, Black science fiction and urban transformation. And Eto, uh, your work is a physical reclamation of public space uh, through the insertion of sculptural fragments. So maybe we can initiate the conversation uh, by further articulating how each one of these projects are uh, conceptualizing and reclaiming uh, landscapes. Uh, Julian, maybe you can start with your project. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. And of course, I appreciate my panelists 
Um, to answer your question, I think one of the things that is core to Afrofuturism is the idea that it represents, um, as Kojo Oshun, as I talked about in my talk, um, frames as a, a set of counter counter feature tools are that are being utilized by African Americans in a century or a period hostile to their existence. So when I think about a place like Eatonville, Florida, I am thinking about it as a, a direct material assertion on the part of African Americans about serious questions related to freedom and the consequences and aftermath of Reconstruction and the Civil War. So in particular, these are African Americans, like scores of African Americans who are coming together to create communities of practice that demonstrate their ability to operate across the spheres of what is quote unquote articulated as modernity in a context whereby the dominant culture does not believe they're able to do so. They do so by in fact attacking at some level the narratives of failure that are associated to blackness and associated to the places that black people are and celebrate their ability to articulate, create, and, and grow institutions that, that sustain them into the future. So at some very basic level by recognizing uh, the thought process and the uh, ideological practicality of these actions, we're reclaiming the, the ways that African Americans in particular are critical of the system that they have inherited, but also pushing it to realize its full sort of ideological potential by creating something that, that realizes exactly the things that African Americans as people who are seeking freedom and after coming out of slavery know that it's possible. And they have to do this again in a, in a context where hostility to their existence is key. So understanding them as um, pragmatic actors that are analyzing the system and reacting in a way that includes institution building and really stressing the power of um, the collective action, I think is really key to understand this reclamation process. Mm -hmm. Maybe Sinatra, we can, we can move to your project. Sure, so um, our project is a collaborative one. It brings um, into a single space, two separate projects that Tahita and I are working on. So Tahita's project, Dig in Philly, um, relies on historic markers that are documenting something that you can't necessarily see, but it's telling the story of something that was there and should be remembered. And she was able to, de to develop her data set based off of a book published by Charles L. Bloxon of all of the local African-American historic markers, which lent itself to a great, though possibly overwhelming data set. There are a lot of points um, through her maps. Also, my project, Sacred Geographic Superimpositions, relies on public art, which is often ephemeral. Um, as I was doing my data collection, uh, some of the mur murals I was looking for were gone. Some of the public art, the sculpt outdoor sculptures I was looking for were gone or were never necessarily established for public view. They were busts that were in, in storage somewhere. Um, and so there was a whole lot of data that was a possibility for this project. Um, Philadelphia is covered in murals. There are an estimated 3,600 murals in the city. Um, and there are about 1,500 outdoor sculptures. So I decided to use the FUBU method for us by us in order to limit the scope of my data set, especially when it came to murals. Um, I wanted to focus on those that were painted by Black artists only. And I was able to collaborate with Mural Arts Philadelphia and they provided a document called African-American Iconic Images. And so I went through that document, identified the um, murals that were painted by Black artists and used those in my data sets, the ones that I could find. Um, for the outdoor sculptures, I was actually using a Smithsonian um, document that had a list of all of these different sculptures that were that depicted Black life. Um, and then I identified which ones were by Black artists. And um, there were very few that were still publicly available. But luckily, I found out about the Monumental Tour, which is a traveling exhibition of outdoor art, outdoor sculptures. Um, and that added four sculptures to my data set, which was fantastic. So just so everyone knows, the data set that um, is coming from the public art is a representative data set. It is not supposed to be an exhaustive list of everything, um, but it is a representation of the way that there's a constant um, state of transformation for public art through these traveling exhibitions, the erasure of murals, removal, removal of, of buildings that had murals on them, or removal of the, st the sculptures themselves. So our work together was able to develop a complementary methodology to map Black Philly through a focus on public space. So the historic mm -hmm. markers and the public art. 
Um, more sites for historic markers will be established. Uh, public art will continue to disappear and be recreated over time. And just like the historic markers, the data will likely outlive some of the physical man manifestations of local um, black landscapes. But through the software that we use, ArcGIS Story Maps, which is actually available online to use, it's you can some, you might be able to get it through your institution. Otherwise, you can pay $100 a year for a, an individual subscription. Very easy to use. Um, so we were able to not only map our data with customizable pop-ups for image and text, but we were, were also able to continue to augment our data set and seamlessly update our maps, um, whether that means adding more sites to the, the maps or more art or um, creating more complex ways to represent the contextual data around it. But we're able to continue to do that because of the way that we've integrated the technology with our data sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about the ways in which you're you're basically uh, instrumentalizing some of these tools to make them do the things that they usually fail to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe shifting to uh, some of your interests, Lisa, you've been looking at black science fiction specifically right. as a way to archive uh, shifts right. in the city. So right. So speaking of about. using tools to do things they're not necessarily set up to do, right? Um, so one of the things I was really interested in, I've been interested in the question of why uh, Kodo Asian talks about this. Why are city, black cities always represented as zones of absolute dystopia? And in really, when you start thinking about it, in general, cities uh, tend to be always represented as zones of absolute dystopia. And um, you know, the answer here has to do a lot with science fiction. And if we can actually show my uh, second slide, if that's possible, whoever's running the slides, I'd love to talk about this really quickly just for a minute, because it's more fun to look at pictures than me, right? Like since we've had the sort of rise of major cities across the West, you've had this tradition, especially of uh, white authors and directors who represent white cities as, uh, or right, any cities as zones of absolute economic dystopia. And um, it's really like these images have become, I think so central to our imagination. It's very hard for us to think outside these science fictional narratives of cities mm -hmm. because uh, we've had these images with us for the last 120 years. And you can see how they carry on, right? From Fritz Long in 1927 to Ridley Scott and up to uh, Spielberg's Ready Player One just a few years ago. And right, and so in these images, we have these ideas that cities are always sites, not just of economic dystopia where the middle class is destroyed and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and more downtrodden, but that these cities, right, they're literally gray. Uh, nature's been destroyed. There's there's nothing natural or wholesome or, or wonderful about them. And I really see think that that's pervaded so much of our thinking. Um, certainly in the mass media, you'll always see cities represented these ways. And often, right, when people talk about dystopian cities, I swear you'll see science fiction images as much as real world images. Um, but what I'm interested in is sort of reclaiming science fiction history, right? And using that as a window into reclaiming larger cultural histories. And in this case, the counter tradition of um, an equally long, almost 150 year tradition of black science fiction authors who have thought about cities as sites of potentially utopian uh, reconfiguration and uh, transformation. And maybe if we can show slide five, I think that that's a good example. And just visually between these slides, you can see there's such a difference in these representations of cities as sites of the future and of sites of technological and social innovation. And one of the things that you'll see um, from, you know, from Pauline Hopkins of One Blood Forward up to Black Panther, right, is this idea that cities don't have to be vertical dystopias. They can be horizontal utopias, perhaps, um, and places where not everything is covered with concrete, but in fact, you'll notice in Wakanda, there's no concrete, right? These are cities where nature and infrastructure find uh, there's a balance, and that balance reflects a certain uh, balance in uh, social relations as well. And I think it's important to recover this because we live in a moment when we're rethinking cities again, not simply because people are moving in and out of cities in sort of interesting new patterns, right? But we're in a moment, especially in the United States, where we keep talking about a nation divided. And one of the divides we talk about is the urban rural divide. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that if we don't understand where our narratives of cities come from and sort of what's at stake in them, it's going to be really hard to move forward and do anything interesting in terms of rethinking uh, our cities and our relations to them. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, but also speaking about, you know, um, these kind of images of cities and our understanding and imagination of cities. 
uh, Eto, your, your work is basically trying to destabilize some of the normative understandings of cities through the insertion of these sculptural fragments. So maybe you can elaborate on the ways in which you're imagining the sculpture as a form of reclamation. Uh, yes, and thank you everyone for um, really just really brilliant insight on, on this topic. And I'm really honored to be participating on this panel. Um, you know, I make things and uh, while I make things, I um, kind of speculate on, you know, what's been forgotten, what um, ways can we commemorate actions, individuals, alternative belief systems um, that have been pushed aside in, in different spaces or have not yet had their platform recognized in different ways. And in my different public art projects, um, and interestingly enough, I have four of them in motion at the same time. So I'm able to have kind of a conversation between them as far as their location, their geometry, their materials, their dimensions, even what the um, potential experience of those objects may be. This one here is uh, right now I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'll be here for about a, a year working on this project called Cast Code at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the building on the right is um, Amy Guffman Hall, which will be a new data science center. Um, so it doesn't exist yet. So um, even there's some speculation in, in that. Um, but what I propose with this sort of cascading visualization of, of data that platforms different topics such as collective health and well-being, data equity, and um, our environment and our care for the environment. But um, the interesting thing about this location is especially part of UPenn's campus is that it was a um, African American, it was an early African American settlement, um, a black bottom, mm -hmm. if you will. Similarly, in um, Alexandria, I'm also working on a public art project there on along Wilkes Street in close proximity to Old Town, that's also a black bottom neighborhood. Um, in Mount Vernon, I'm working on a project called Peaceful Journey, which we see here in this uh, rendering. Um, that pays homage to Heavy D. So, you know, Heavy D is a rapper from Money Earning Mount Vernon. So that's the alternative kind of hip hop name of it. But, um, you know, if you move through Mount Vernon and speak to a lot of folks there, he has really entrenched in the community there. He's even, he was even friends with the current mayor of Mount Vernon. Um, so by name, I um, kind of wanted to pay homage to Heavy D with this sculpture even though my uh, purpose here as an artist was to kind of create something that spoke to transitions and, and transformation through um, uh, geometry and, and through material and things of that nature. So what I try to do is I just basically uh, intersect my uh, agendas as an artist in, in thinking about what's missing, but also I think about what other stories can I tell about this place or this site. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eto. Um, Sinatra, uh, returning to your work, um, to me, what, what makes the project really powerful is um, the fact that it is simultaneously cathartic and pedagogical. Um, and it's an attempt to produce knowledge while also helping us process this ongoing erasure. Uh, so maybe can you, can you speak about uh, the ways in which you're positioning your work in contradistinction to uh, you know, let's say the the sanitizing and kind of homogenizing logics of gentrification. Yeah, so the first um, kind of discovery, I guess I'll call it, um, that really stood out to me in response to this question when uh, Tahid and I were working on this project is we didn't expect much from South Philly. South Philly is kind of painted as a place for European immigrants and their descendants. Um, and we didn't expect there to be a Black narrative to insert there, but the data showed otherwise, right? Especially um, in terms of historical markers. And so it was a great way to understand that while we may not be there in large numbers today, there is a story to tell. And if you map that, that data, you're able to, uh, to, to tell that story in a dynamic way that includes text and images and all of that. So um, for all, those who are attending this panel, if you, shameless plug, check out our story map, which is um, easy to, to navigate to. It's in the um, caption for our video, but I created a bit.ly, so it's easy to get to bit.ly slash a Philly John, J-A-W-N. Um, and you're able, you're, you'll be able to see that specific story that we tell about South 
um, Philly. And also with public art, I'm very sensitive to the way that it's used in the process of gentrification. So it's been a really interesting experience to document Black art by Black artists in Black communities at a time when usually that's kind of the indication that the, 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 the socioeconomic status of this community might change very soon. Um, also, I'm affiliated with Temple University. And so while I was doing this work, Temple is located in North Philly. I'm getting all of these uh, emails at least once a week, usually more, um, these alert emails about a shooting, a robbery, whatever it is, very unsafe, right? And so I'm venturing out into these spaces that I've never been to before. I'm new to the city. I moved during the pandemic. I don't get to explore much. Um, and I'm by myself and I've also got one to $2,000 worth of technology on me at any given moment. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go early in the morning while everyone is asleep because hopefully I'll be safest then. Um, and that fear, while it kept me safe, it also almost caught, cost me a really beautiful experience that I had while I was doing my data collection. I was photographing um, a mural entitled Tribute to Urban Horsemen. And one of the actual urban horsemen lives across the street, sort of like a perpendicular type of thing from that mural. And he was trying to get my attention. And I was like, oh, God, let me hurry up and get to my car. Um, but he wanted to show me that he, there was, he had this book from Mural Arts that they published. And there was a photo of him um, when they were dedicating the mural because he's one of the folks, you know, that's featured through the theme. And I was so happy that I didn't kind of rush away from him and get in my car and run away. And that I actually did take a moment to listen and see what he wanted to share with me because that was wonderful. And it provided a really helpful resource because I went and checked out that book um, the next day. And so overall, we have this broader responsibility, Tahita and I, to develop an anti-racist digital humanities methodology that can be replicated at black institutions with limited resources and limited capacity. Everyone doesn't have a virtual reality lab like Temple University does, right? Everyone doesn't have staff that already knows how to code in C Sharp and how to use 3D printers and all of that. But what we were able to produce with this was very simple. Neither of us are GIS professionals. Um, Tahita is in media and communications. I'm an anthropologist by training. But this was a very simple way through ArcGIS software to create this map that we were able to kind of tinker with a bit to get it to look the way that we wanted it to look. And so it could really be replicated elsewhere, maybe not the exact same thing, but it could be a, a representation of Rosenwald schools or free towns or something like that that just kind of tells a story of a specific mode of blackness within um, a landscape, right? And there's other uh, free solutions outside of ArcGIS because again, it is $100 a, a year. But again, we're not GIS professionals. It was easier for us to find the thing that kind of helped us negotiate between cost and skill set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad you you described that that personal anecdote because I would say you know uh, those are the types of relationships that are becoming more and more impossible, um, especially you know with, with the ongoing process of displacement and dispossession. Um, so just shifting slightly to to Lisa's project, uh, Lisa, in your case, I'm really interested in um, your fundamental argument that uh, Black science fiction is not only um, a projection of a possible future, uh, but it's also a way to process, um, document, and really grapple with the challenges of the present. Um, for example, your research demonstrates kind of a clear genealogy, right? The optimism that was embedded in the Great Migration, followed by the anxieties of urban renewal projects, uh, to more recently, the kind of reclamation of the city. Uh, what you call newtopian visions. Right. So can you can you speculate on how um, black science fiction could potentially be corresponding with current shifts, uh, current demographic shifts, uh, the phenomenon that a lot of people are calling the reverse great migration mm -hmm. or the return of black people to uh, cities in the South like Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, et cetera. Right. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm actually I'm so glad you asked that because that was part of the larger argument that had to go by the wayside for the sake of a 10 minute video. Um, so thank you. This is wonderful. Uh, I do think that we see it and that the Newtopian stories that I talk about at the end of my talk are part of actually a larger set of stories that are exploring uh, or reacting to extrapolating from and predicting the future of the, the great reverse migration that as you're talking about it right. So what we've been seeing, right, since the 70s and 80s, 
is, is uh, black people returning south for a variety of reasons, uh, economic, right, economic opportunity. A lot of people want to return to family. You see a lot of uh, discussion about returning to family and to, uh, familiar cultural places and cultural byways. And then, of course, uh, if any of you follow New York Times columnist Charles Blow, you'll know that he thinks there's great opportunity for political change in this as well. And if you haven't read Blow's book, The Devil You Know, I highly recommend it. It's a really fascinating and very utopian, I think, uh, sort of imagination of what would happen if the if uh, 22, the 22% of uh, Black Americans who currently live north moved south, and how, if everyone very carefully arranged where they lived, you could really radically start to shift politics. And I think that that's really interesting right there. So we are beginning to see uh, science fiction that does grapple with this. And I didn't get a chance to talk about it uh, just for whatever reasons, like I said, time uh, constraints. But in particular, I would like to uh, give a shout out to and recommend you all go check out MV Media Publishers. Um, they are an Afrofuturist publishing uh, company located physically here in Atlanta, Georgia, and they have a series of anthologies all about the city and thinking through the rise of especially other or the resurrection or reemergence or emergence of uh, powerful black cities in the modern era and potentially in the future. And in particular, three anthologies you might check out uh, the city, logically enough. So. Uh, Terminus, which is specifically stories about Atlanta. And those are really exciting. I think they started telling some of those at Georgia Tech about 10 years ago. And it's been really fun to watch the Terminus mythos grow. And then finally, cyberpunk. So taking like sort of cyberpunk kind of visions of the city and really rethinking them through a black lens. Um, those are all really great um, places where we can see thinking about what that might look like as uh, people move back south and as the weight of uh, urbanization moves back into the American South. At the same time, right, one of the things that's been really interesting about the reverse migration is that Black people aren't necessarily moving back into Atlanta and into Dallas and into Houston. They're moving into the suburbs, right? And this is a really mm -hmm. interesting phenomenon we've again seen for the last 30 or 40 years is that the suburbs, which were originally, right, the refuge for white flight, for people leaving all the horrible problems of the city, uh, right? And then of course, setting up all the redlining laws and everything so that black people and women and LGBTQ plus people all sort of stayed in those dystopian cities, right? But suddenly we have all those pesky people moving into these suburbs. So that's an interesting thing that's part of the great migration is that we're gonna have to start rethinking urban spaces. And you certainly see this in Atlanta where only a fraction of our metropolitan, of our, uh, population actually lives in the city, like maybe a tenth of it, I think. And what's interesting to me is so far, we're not seeing a lot of science fiction about uh, what that means as the colors of the suburbs change. However, we have seen a lot of horror fiction, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, as we've seen an explosion of black authors and especially black women authors in horror fiction. And um, so if you really wanna see sort of speculative fiction about what it might look like uh, as the great migration changes the look of uh, suburbs, you know, I would suggest maybe looking at, well, Jordan Peele's Get Out, right? I mean, that's a great example mm -hmm. right there that many of us have already seen. But if you're looking for uh, some new stuff to look at, Cheshire Burke is a marvelous horror and science fiction author. She's been called the literary heir to Octavia Butler. And her, I think it's her 2011 anthology, Let's Play White, explores some of these issues. Um, and, uh, those are actually the two big ones that I would want to recommend right now. They're the, so I'll stop right there. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, um, as someone who partially grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta, um, I'm very much interested in the suburbanization of Blackness. Mm -hmm. um, shifting to, to your work, Eto, uh, your public art projects really operate uh, as a set of ambiguous interventions in the public realm. And to me, what's really interesting is the ways in which they oscillate uh, between historical and Afrofuturistic objects. Uh, but you're also, in some ways, refusing any type of delineation between past and present or linear conceptions of time. And I'm, I'm just really specifically interested in um, the aesthetic ambitions behind your work, uh, because they, there seems to be an endless set of references across time and space ranging from a fallen obelisk in Egypt to, you know, the, the patterning um, and form making that we associate with computational design. 
So maybe you can talk about that and the types of friction, uh, the type of friction you, you're trying to create with the generic urban uh, landscape. Thank you, Emmanuel. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And um, I think about what I, I'm doing as a form of time traveling, as a form of shape shifting. I'm constantly researching and, as you mentioned, pulling lots of different references, past, present, and in a speculative, speculative way from the future to sort of um, determine how these things will take form and, and how they're constructed. Um, I think a lot of my approach aesthetically is aligned with something that, you know, oddly enough, is called the new aesthetics. <laughs> and uh, this author, James Birdall, is, along with a lot of other folks, have contributed to kind of a collective understanding of, of what this is. In general, it refers to visual language that's influenced by technology and the internet, um, by a blending of the physical and the virtual world. So this includes everything like glitch, scratching, sampling. Um, some artists um, I associate with this are uh, Sandra Perry, Stephanie Dinkins, um, Ekene Jaoma, uh, Damian Davis, um, you know, the list goes on. Um, but the idea there is um, wondering what happens when the robots wave back at you is, is one, one writer kind of how one wrote, writer described new aesthetics. So how does technology act on us? How do we respond to it when we encounter it? And it's kind of a little bit bizarre, but a little bit familiar to us is what I'm interested in. Just as a side, you know, um, I, I kind of do things even technically that are a bit challenging, like in Peaceful Journey, I'm trying to weld uh, stainless steel and core 10 steel together. So there's concerns about you know, putting two dissimilar metals together. But in some research, I found that even in um, some train uh, train cars, they have an element called a soul bar, which kind of forms the, the, the structure of, of the train. And then the kind of everything is kind of stuck onto that. And they use two different steels, core 10 steel and stainless steel to achieve that because each material has a different property. So um, even some of the technical challenges that I set up in order to achieve um, these aesthetics um, are a way of, you know, traveling back in time, but also projecting forward into the future. Thank you, Eto. Um, Julian, in, uh, in your work uh, or your examination of uh, Eatonville, Florida, uh, which is the first all black municipality in post reconstruction, uh, period. Uh, there, there seems to be this interest in what you're calling the counter future practices, but a lot of it is also predicated on your interest in uh, examining uh, Afrofuturism's uh, roots in activism. So uh, I was wondering if you could really articulate the differences between those two realms. Uh, at what points do they begin to overlap, uh, both aesthetically and politically? And at what points do they begin to bifurcate? I think when we think about activism in the context of Afrofuturism, that uh, as base, Afrofuturism is, is inherently activist in nature. And one of the reasons that this comes to the fore in the consideration of, of Eatonville is that as a person who's working with um, so an organization in Eatonville in the contemporary period, uh, you, you're basically working in a space that is a legacy of kind of future practice so that the people who are currently alive are able to articulate in some very direct way a legacy that they can scratch back and, and, and identify as, as coming from a kind of freedom vision. Even the town slogan is the, the, the town that freedom built. And so for them, the space itself represents a kind of activism that is directly related to a kind of positive blackness. And, and this comes comes through at some level in the way that someone like uh, Zoya Hurston, sorry, I'm in a conference room and if I don't move enough, the lights go down. <laughs> um, and this is in a place where uh, Zoya Hurston, who I, I sometimes talk about as being under theorized because her work is actually as a child of a kind of future space, she's often articulating against a kind of hegemony around whiteness that mm -hmm. stands apart in, in her present in the, in the Harlem Renaissance, 
but really is exemplified through the, the nature of the scope of her work and, and the goals of her work. And so to me, the, the definition of Eatonville as a space has to do with a kind of activism and the activism is accomplished by its continuing persistence as a place that is black and that that encamp encapsulates the, the identity of black people and their aspirations and their dreams. And even in the contemporary moment, the articulation remains very clear to the town, the, the town people and, and, and its practice. Uh, the places where it becomes to uh, starts to diverge, I think, really do come into in, into context as the institutions have to negotiate more and more the pressure of the residents having to um, contend with organizations and connections that extend outside the community. Uh, in some ways, this can come through in, in, narr in narratives from the residents about um, almost thinking about the past in a kind of utopian way. And, and another way that we I, you can see this in the context of Eatonville in particular is that many people have a vision of Eatonville who've never been there that is at some level tied directly to particular historical points and writings articulated by Hurston, but they don't correspond to contemporary moments where it's a real place with a real municipality facing economic, social, and political challenges. And in fact, those challenges have forced it to, to create institutions and adopt practices that are again, a reaction to what the residents see as a hostile external uh, hegemonic political and social landscape. So I wouldn't necessarily, in any case, in any historic black towns, and yes, Eatonville is often referred to as the first um, a municipality in the United States, but it really emerged at a time where a number of municipalities were created across the South, all of them in response to the opportunity posed by the inner reconstruction for African Americans to create institutional spaces where they could shore up themselves in a rapidly emerging hostile environment. And so these communities that are uh, municipalities do have the, the benefit of a kind of legal structure that allows for the institutions within them and the people there to have the greatest control. Whereas those institutions that were simply settlements or more are, um, enclaves within a wider white institute, white community got absorbed and were unable to have the tools to effectively push back uh, as the political landscape transformed. I, I understand the nature of your question and I appreciate the, I, the idea that Afrofuturism and activism um, may seem some, somewhat separated, but ultimately I think one of the things that comes through, at least for me, in the consideration of Eatonville and the spaces like it, is that if institutional structures are created by black people, they are mindful of the fact that they need to, at some level, create the tools for allow them to persist and survive in a way that is active, that 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 yep. actual survival is active. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I was just trying to be provocative and I'm glad you uh, <laughs> offered some precision. Um, so maybe shifting a little bit to the audience questions, um, I'm trying. I'm I'm gonna try to simplify this question uh, from Karen, uh, but Karen is asking um, for you guys to maybe speculate a little bit more. Uh, she's she's really interested in the conversations we've been having around cities, but she she's asking if you guys can speculate a little bit more on the imagination of open spaces or spaces that have to remain subterranean. And I think this is somewhat in line with the conversations we've been having about, um, you know, resisting a, a certain level of transparency or legibility in order to avoid displacement or dispossession. Um, so she's just kind of asking about, um, she, she has a few references uh, from uh, Okoye's writings uh, on uh, Ajlafo uh, or Igbo uh, Forbidden Forest. But basically she's really interested in, I think, at least the way I'm reading it is uh, somehow talking a little bit about uh, Glissant's concept of the right to opacity as well. So are there spaces within these cities that we need to keep somewhat opaque and subterranean? So I'll take a first stab at the question. Um, I'm actually working on another project that has me kind of thinking about this issue specifically because um, 
I'm, I've created 3D models of all of the public art. I'm also creating 3D models of African sculptures and African instruments that are in the collections of the institutions that I work with. And uh, my original plan was to put them on Wikimedia Commons. So this is a, kind of a little different, but it's still a speculative issue um, related to the question. Um, and I was informed that a lot of game developers are downloading that content that we're making publicly available and then throwing it into their um, environments that are not properly contextualizing anything. They're not giving any credit to the institution, to the, the, the person who created the model or anything like that. And we also know that within games, uh, the gaming community can be um, quite um, racist. They can be quite um, homophobic, misogynist. And so as I'm thinking through the uh, possibility of making collections objects that are usually in storage and don't see the light of day many times or aren't getting enough resources uh, put toward research, researching them, I'd like to make them more accessible, but I also don't want to make them so accessible that they're able to be co-opted and mm -hmm. the resources now um, kind of abused, you know? So it's something I'm still thinking about, uh, but on the right track. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at this as well. I think one of the things that um, we gleaned from uh, thinking about black Black townships uh, like Eatonville, and like I said, the, the class of townships created in the late 19th and early 20th century, is that they relied on a collectivism that we can think of as the individual town as a collective action, right? If you think about some of the descriptions of Eatonville that you see in some of the Hurston writing, right? It's very utopian. Sorry, lights again. Um, but the, I also rely very heavily on. Uh, networking amongst themselves. And I think one of the things that the the so sort of the question of, you know, is this is this going to have, do you need to be underground? I think in the contemporary period, what the past suggests is that contemporary activism connected to black spaces is by default, if it is controlled by people of color, placed underground and the real value of these systems is their ability to communicate with each other and, and make connections around goals that are sustaining and, and and future oriented so that at some level if networks of activism um you can think about this in the sense that like if these spaces of of this this thing uh, spaces of color are able to network together using digital tools then as a lot of Afrofuturists articulated in the contemporary landscape, they're able to collectively um, promote uh, practices, support each other, and stimulate uh, opportunities. And I think that's one of the things that really feeds into the excitement of Afrofuturism as a global movement, this ability mm -hmm. to push beyond the boundaries of the individual, but through digital means, uh, engage with like broader questions of transformation, and affirmation. And I think that's some of the things that you see theorists like Ronaldo Anderson talking about when he talks about Afrofuturism, sort of influenced by social media. And it comes through in, in the ways that we're increasingly hearing about Afrofuturist practice globally. Yeah. I think, um, I guess the way I would approach this from my perspective, and uh, it's really interesting to hear my colleagues' take on it. Um, is uh, when we think about public art, especially in the United States, whether it's in public space, park space, or even on university and college campuses, there's a huge discrepancy between when we look at the diversity of individuals who creates this work, um, as far as most of the public artwork in these collections are white men. Um, and then from my perspective, I take it one step further, when you think about how these works are made, even how they're installed, most of the folks who um, are involved within that work stream, engineering, architecture, um, even the folks driving the trucks to bring these large pieces of artwork to these locations are also white men. So um, I just wonder how that could be disrupted. I wonder how that um, ecosystem can be more reflective of where the works are being installed. Um, I'm wondering if our experience of the works um, could be more interactive. So in, in addition to, you know, an object being there, can the object be an instrument 
a musical instrument or some or a communication device or or something else you know that is aligned with the belief system of the folks who are living there um and in that way i think there's some subversion i think there are some secrets that could be embedded in, into into the objects so i'm really I, I love the way the question was phrased, the idea that are there places that need to stay opaque or subterranean? And, you know, thinking about that in science fiction, that gets dramatized really literally. I mean, and you see this throughout the history of black science fiction for every single utopian city that celebrates the accomplishments of black people in the real world or, or somehow refers back to them. There's also the reference back to the reality that often those successes in the real world brought on real world attacks by jealous white people, right? And so what you see, I mean, from Pauline Hopkins of One Blood Forward is that whenever you uh, have these representations of these utopian cities, there's always literally something that makes them opaque or hidden, either a shielding technology of some sort, um, mm -hmm. subterranean tunnels. Sometimes the cities are all the way underground. That's another way you can do it. Um, and there's always a sense that, yes, there are things that are going to need to be hidden, at least for some point in time, because you have to sort of make it like these cities become spaceships traveling through hostile terrains and times, right? Um, on the more positive side, I would say that since Sam Delaney forward, we've also been seeing a tradition of imagining that these kinds of utopian black cities uh, would be predicated on literally having opaque spaces built into them. Delaney talks a lot about the importance of having unlicensed or outlaw zones in cities places where uh, people of different races and classes and uh, sexes and genders can and ages and abilities can meet uh, away from the official sort of like system of surveillance and that these are the spaces where genuine connection and real kinds of creativity come from. And, you know, he talks about this in uh, Red Square, Red Times Square, Blue Times Square, right, when he talks about his own relationship to uh, the porn theaters in New York City in the 1970s and how important those were as sort of interesting creative spaces. And then he dramatizes them in his fiction through these unlicensed zones um, that operate more generally as spaces where people can, can be creative in very unorthodox ways. And then I was thinking we continue to see that today. If any of you know Tade Thompson's work, he's a Nigerian science fiction author, um, just swept the nomos. He's been sweeping awards all across the world. And his Rosewater trilogy imagines uh, right the, the megacity of Lagos right next to an alien megacity called Rosewater. And it's a dome and it's opaque and no one can see what's going on in the dome. And even when you're in the dome, there's like four levels of reality operating. So you really can't see what's going on in the dome even when you're in it. And it's interesting that somehow uh, that opacity can um, be not just defensive, but also productive. Yeah, definitely. Um... So we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. Oh, go I ahead. Comment, can I comment on that? Because I really yeah, yeah, want to, yeah. like, um, it, one of the things about Afrofuturism, you know, like, in my video, I talk a little about the, the idea of the future industry, the, the idea of bars from cultural issue, and it's very important to, to how I think about seeing a place like Eatonville because it's, it kind of exists across these different spheres. And I, and I just want to say out loud, you know, I think one of the things that Afrofuturism is asking us to do is to question why it is that the modernity that we understand, why you need to be, you know, why do we need to be sub, subversive? Well, like, why, why, do, why do the Black spaces need to be um, hidden, right? Because, of course, mm -hmm. you know, from a historical standpoint, you know, a Black Wall Street, a place right. that's, you know, economically uh, successful, gets destroyed. And in fact, that is the history of African-American efforts at some level. And this is another one of the things that when you when you, you uh, examine some of these smaller African-American townships like in Eatonville, it's isolation at some level because it's in central Florida. Not, it's not on the coast. So it's, it, it is literally isolated. It's not in the context of the contemporary period, but in the historical context, it's very isolated. And a lot of the other historical Black towns that remain and are still still municipalities are geographically isolated, whereby other locations that are closer to um, sort of population centers where white people can be called, can become the victim of sort of political, uh, basically can become the victims of violence 
triggered by political or economic uh, instability. So like, you know, Afrofuturism uh, as a, you know, epistemological toolkit is, is showing, is, is suggesting over and over again, both in the past and the contemporary, that there's something to be said about the nature of modernity and its value set and, and the hostility to blackness that, that we have to pay attention to. And I, and I you know, I don't want us to uh, forget that even in those imagined spaces, there's this sort of material legacy here that we're being reminded of uh, in a way that's, you know, in some level disturbing. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I mean, um, two, th th there are a series of questions that I'm going to try to combine. Uh, one, mostly because this is also something I'm really interested in. Uh, and I think all of you have been speaking about different forms of collectivity as, as resistance. Um, and one of the questions uh, that's being asked is, is very much in line with this conversation around uh, land tenure, right? Um, and what does it mean to actually collectively uh, be stewards of the land uh, instead of uh, relying on the current system, which is based on individual ownership, right? And in that conversation, how do we begin to build solidarity between, uh, you know, issues of displacement and dispossession within Black communities and also the historic kind of uh, dispossession of Native Americans? Um, so maybe you guys can begin to to speak about that. And on the opposite uh, side of uh, uh, that spectrum, uh, one of uh, the audience members is asking about the current expansion of these ownership systems into the digital realm um, and the, the ongoing kind of speculation and, and digital uh, real estate, um, but also the metaverse, et cetera. I know those, those are both okay, very I'll, difficult. I'll, <laughs> you can, you can start with the solidarity question, yeah, maybe, yeah. and then we can shift to the to the digital. Yeah, like I'm thinking one for the team here. Um, <laughs> what I would say about the solidarity thing, if, if the past suggests anything, it suggests that um, collectivism is an important uh, toolkit uh, for people of color, for African Americans. The institutions, networks of act. Uh, networks of action and thought are important in helping facilitate future generations, you know, cultivating resources. This is a, a toolkit that that is replicated across space and across time, and across uh, sort of marginalized groups. These are all it doesn't necessarily be black; it could be people of color, regardless. And that is something that we have to recognize. And at some level, those same ideas have have been a, a under assault by the sort of transformation of the uh, from a urban industrial to information economy. So the, like the material questions that were central to the establishment of uh, stability for African-Americans in the late 19th, and early 20th century, I, I think they are, especially in black townships, thinking about a material citizenship that is especially clear in the rural context. If you think about this sort of the, the division between a kind of W.B. Du Bois versus a Booker T. Washington, Washington's emphasis on the rural is very much earth. It's very much, you know, material. It's very much sustaining. Yes, there are problems with his ideology and other aspects, but it makes sense in, in, in that regard. Um, on this question of the future oriented one, uh, I do think that we always have to be mindful of the ways that uh, technology can come under control, even if it has liberatory aspects. I mean, like this is one of the the, the tragedies at, at writ large in terms of like the transformation we might associate with the internet. And for us to ensure freedom, we have to ask our institutional bodies to make sure that certain questions around access, certain questions around uh, a baseline related to our ability to, to, to utilize these technologies are assured. Um, we think about things like net neutrality. We, we think about things um, along those lines. And those are really important questions that if we don't force, like collectively call attention to the people in charge, I don't think that they're going to answer to that. And that doesn't mean that there still can't be freedom movements that are attached to these technological innovations. But almost all of those descriptions in science fiction are about hacking a system that's controlled by someone else. Whereas 
a lot of the things that we're visioning here are people of color, the marginalized people being empowered by having control, having the tools themselves. And those are slightly different things. And to, and to ensure you get the latter, you really have to think about the structure that you're looking at. Yeah, I guess just, uh, I, th I think that was beautiful, Julian. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I, I think just to add to that, um, this idea of cultural sovereignty, I think comes into play. And um, especially in the first part of the question, thinking about stewards, who are, who are the stewards of the land and, and how does that happen? I think um, now there are a lot of gatekeepers, whether they're institutional or governmental, that kind of determine, you know, how space will be divided, how cultural activity will, will happen in spaces. Um, and that's coming from, you know, a top down, you know. Um, and I'm wondering how that could be disrupted, um, how that can be negotiated um, in a different way um, so that there's no sort of permission granting for art to happen, for life to happen, for cultural activity to happen in, in these spaces. All right. Um, we have a couple of minutes left uh, if any of you want to make closing remarks. But uh, it's been such a wonderful discussion. And thank you guys for, for really stretching our minds and taking us to places that we all need to be fully engaged with. Um, any closing remarks? I think one thing, actually, I would like to say, and this sort of ladders back to the last question and the issue of community is, is simply, you know, one thing that I really see as I'm doing this work in science fiction is thinking uh, not just about connecting um, uh, maybe even across racial boundaries, but also thinking about the role of gender in, in community building and, and the need to sort of think through these intersectional issues as well. I mean, mm -hmm. from the very beginning, you see, you know, male and female authors alike thinking through like, what are the role of women going to be in uh, reclaiming these urban spaces and, and as citizens of the future? And um, that's so important, especially when you think about community activism, right? Which happens in different ways. And, you know, historically often, big public uh, actions happen, uh, men sort of take uh, the, the big public media roles and it's women who are doing the community building behind the scenes. And uh, I love that science fiction dramatizes that and allows that kind of action to take center stage. And uh, I hope it can be a template for all of us to think about the multiple ways that, that uh, community activism happens. And maybe somehow that connects with the land ownership and the land reclamation thing, but I'm not sure how. But, and I'll just I add related. Explore all your allies, right? I guess that that's the, 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 the lesson to be learned there. And I'll just add relatedly, it really matters. So I work with data, right? It really matters who the data is being curated by. Um, when we, I'm working with Wikidata and there is a ton of information about white artists, especially white male artists. But when we get into specifically black artists that are from Philadelphia, because that's the subset that I'm working with, um, there is quite limited information available, right? And um, it takes someone who's interested in doing that work. Wikidata is there for anyone to make the edits, but it takes someone who's interested in doing that work, who has the research available in order to make those edits to the Wiki Wikidata pages, to create the Wikidata pages. And then this enhances the digital visibility of those artists as you're doing a Google search for sculptors from Chicago. Now those who uh, may not have come up before those pages were created, now they'll exist. Um, in that Google knowledge graph and you'll get all of their biological information, biographical information, sorry. So it really does matter who is involved um, in addition to what resources we're using because I mean, I'm absolutely using the tools of the oppressor to, to liberate <laughs> the data that I'm creating. But because I have this Afrofuturist lens about not only um, getting the data there, but also doing something with it, that kind of illustrates how these things can be used, um, whether it's just to tell the story or to demonstrate the way the tool can be used at another institution. All of that has been really important for the work that I'm doing in this fellowship. Yeah, and I would also say um, the archive is very important. I was just like, yeah. it, 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 the, the, the digital public record is incredibly important to try to understand the lost legacy of black activism, but that is something that is always being built. So every person has to think about how their data, their data of sovereignty, think about your data sovereignty. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you all so much. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always great when these conversations around intersectionality always begin by acknowledging the unevenness of the ground itself. Um, so thank you all so much for the clarity, but also for, for inspiring us to keep thinking about these things. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have to say. And I believe we're going to another room for a debrief. Uh, so if audience members want to join us there, we'll have a more informal conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.